justification. And the court looks at two justifications. It says, first of all, fighting tax evasion or avoidance, because that is a justification uh, in public interest to, 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 to discriminate, right? Um, and it says, in the first place, it's necessary to assess whether the difference in treatment at issue or main proceedings may be justified by grounds relating to fight against tax evasion and tax avoidance. In order for a restriction on the freedom of establishment to be justified, the specific objection of such a restriction must be to prevent the conduct involving the creation of wholly artificial arrangements. And this wholly artificial arrangement is an important term, with a view to escaping the tax normally due on the profits, right? And, and then the court says, secondly, the principle of proportionality requires that the refusal of the right to a deduction should be limited to the proportion of that interest which exceeds, and here it comes, what would have been agreed had the relationship between parties been one at arm's length. So the, the court says, you know, as long as your transaction is proportionate and not wholly artificial, then you should be able to get your deduction, right? And it and, 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 and describes what wholly artificial is and it describes the principle of proportionality. And, 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 and then it goes on to say, as the tax agency acknowledged, as a, this is the Swedish tax agency acknowledged um, in essence at the hearing, the exception may also cover transactions carried out on an arm's length basis. So it doesn't only cover wholly artificial arrangements. In other words, the fictitious nature of a transaction at issue is not decisive for refusing the right to a deduction because the intention of the company concerned to take on a debt, mainly for tax reasons, is sufficient to justify refusal of the right to a deduction. In other words, you know, even if your transaction is real, but the, one of the main purposes of the transaction is to save tax, then you can't get the deduction even if the interest is at arm's length, right? Um, and, and, and then the court says, however, the fact alone that a company wishes to make a deduction of interest payments in a cross-border situation in the absence of any artificial transfer cannot justify a measure which undermines the freedom of establishment. So the court says, you know, saving revenue is not a reason, is not a justification for limiting the freedom of establishment. And it says so in much further, uh, clearer terms in, 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 in looking at the next justification. And next justification is a preserving a balanced allocation of taxing power. So what the court has said is it said, you know, there are a number of, of, of fundamental freedoms. You can't restrict those unless you have a, 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 a justification for doing so. And one of them is the preserving a balanced allocation of taxing powers, which means that taxpayers should not in general at a random be able to move um, taxes from one country to another. Uh, by themselves. So, so this becomes a very compli complicated argument, as you can see in itself, right? So as the court repeatedly held, and, 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 and part of the uh, balance allocation of, of tax and powers also relates to tax treaties. You know, what the, what the court has said is that in tax treaties, countries have decided among themselves bilaterally how to divide the allocation of tax and powers, and those treaties must also be respected, right? So the court now goes on to say, as the court has repeatedly held, so it said many times, the need to maintain the balance allocation of power to impose taxes between member states can be accepted where the system in question is designed to prevent conduct which is liable to jeopardize the right of a member state to exercise its power uh, to tax in relation to activities carried on on its territory. So this seems fair. But then it goes on. And it says the difference between the rules examined in X and X, which was a Dutch case, um, lies in the fact that under the rules to that judgment, the conditions for the deduction differed according to whether a company being acquired was part of the same tax entity as the acquiring company. And again, and the Dutch case very briefly was also a limitation on interest deductions. Um, but there the Dutch rule said, you know, if you acquire a, a company from a third party, and you borrow money for that, then the interest is deductible. But when you acquire a company from a group company um, and you borrow money, then then there's uh, group-wise nothing changes, and therefore the interest cannot be deductible, right? And and and, and the Dutch lost that case, so it was in the, in, in in interest of of uh, the Dutch tax uh, government. Um, so it was in the interest of Sweden to show that the, you know this case is not the same as X and X, right? In the present case, the difference in treatment 
is based on the requirement of residence. So not, not whether you acquire a company that's outside a group or not for the credit company. The advantage which Lexel is claiming in the present case cannot be confused with the advantage provided by consolidation within a single tax entity. The dispute in the main proceedings concern the possibility of deducting interest charges. And, and that's why I said, you know, there probably were group contributions within Sweden as well when I described the, 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 the graphics. And the court has said you are allowed to limit your, your, your group contributions to one country only, and you don't have to allow that cross-border, right? The, the, it goes on to explain the reduction in tax revenue cannot be regarded as an overriding reason in the public interest which may be relied on to justify a measure which is in principle contrary to a fundamental freedom. A finding to the contrary, in other words, if you are allowed to limit the, the freedom of establishment because you otherwise lose tax revenue, would amount to allowing member states to restrict the freedom of establishment. In other words, the freedom of establishment will mean nothing. So both justifications have been rejected. Furthermore, as was noted during the hearing, the interest charges in respect of which Lexel sought the deduction would have been deductible if BF have not been an associated company. So what the court says here is, you know, I mean, if BF was a French company unrelated, you still would have suffered a loss of revenue, but then it would have been OK. But now just because it's a related company, it's not OK, which which the court says, you know, make, make things look a little weird. Accordingly, the justification based on the preservation of a balanced allocation of power to impose taxes between member states cannot be accepted. And then the Swedish court followed up. Uh, you can see, I mean, the, the, the decision was from the Court of Justice was from January 2021. And then in March uh, 2021, uh, the Supreme Court said in the Lexel case and before the national, national forum, it said the Supreme Court approves the appeal and declares that Le Lexel AB is entitled to a deduction for the current interest expenses, right? Because what happened was the Supreme Administrative Court in Sweden first asked the CJU is this in line with EU law or not? And the court says, no, it is not. And then the national court says, it's not in line with the EU law and therefore you can't, you, know, you, can't, you can't limit the interest deduction. And it had, it has done so again later in the year in the Husqvarna's case, um, where it, it, it also quoted uh, the Lexel decision. It says, from the conditions provided, it appears that the borrowing in the lending company would have been covered by the regulations on group companies, uh, group com contributions, if both companies had been Swedish. The Supreme Court states that it's therefore not in accordance with Article 49 to refuse the deduction for the current interest. That was the Lexel case. So let's have a look at the, at the, at the PRA case very quickly. You had Luxembourg, PRA is like a, 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 a finance debit uh, credit kind of company that, 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 that helps, I think, individuals and, and, and businesses with, uh, with extending loans and stuff. In Norway, they had uh, the PRA Group Europe uh, subholding and you had PRA Group Europe AS and PRA Group Europe AS was later um, merge into the, the subholding company. So the real taxpayer here is uh, PRA Group Europe as before the court because by the time this case got to the court, even though it was PRA Group Finance that was denied the interest deduction, um, technically it is it, it is the PRA Group which is the litigating party because PRA subholding doesn't exist anymore. <clears throat> And the court then says, as far as uh, these are the facts, and the court says, as observed by the Norwegian government, group contribution rules have been justified by the need to preserve the balance allocation of taxing powers. And we've already talked about this, right? Because the CJU have already said, you know, that you, you, you can limit um, uh, tax consolidation within one country. Um, and, and, and the CJU and the EFTA court tried to interpret the rules of the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU and the EFTA Treaty very similar where those treaties are similar, right? So you don't get disparities between the treaties. And, and, and the EFTA court goes on to explain here, the court observes that the group contribution allow intergroup transfers of profits from one company to another within the same group without payment of consideration in return. The absence of in consideration entails that such transfers should not be understood as transactions of a commercial nature in ordinary sense. In such cases, there is no scope to test the commercial nature of the contributions, for instance, against the arm's length principle. So the, the court also explains why the group contribution rules are different from the interest deduction limitation rules, right? And the court goes on to say, 
The restriction in the present case derives from the combination of limited interest deduction and group contribution rules, rather than group contribution rules alone. When assessing justification for any advantage, this advantage, if, if this advantage falls outside the scope of the group, uh, group transfer scheme, this advantage must be assessed and justified separately, right? So this is what they try to do. And then they say the balance allocation of taxing rights may be preserved by refusing an interest deduction where the arrangement is wholly artificial or to the extent that the debt equity ratio or interest ratio are not in line with what would have been an arm's length lender. So if the loan is not at arm's length, then you can deny the deduction, right? But then it says in cases involving interest limitation or deductibility, the, C the ECJ, that's what the Court of Justice of the EU used to be called before, it, called, it used to be called the European Court of Justice, has not permitted member states to restrict such rules to entirely domestic situations. Such rules may only be applied to deny deductions um, to the extent that they do not have underlying commercial justification based on an, uh, based on an assessment at arm's length. And then they so so if you know if 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 it is not at arm's length that and it is wholly artificial effectively, the principle of proportionality requires that the refusal of the right of to a deduction should be limited to the proportion of that interest which exceeds what would have been agreed had the relationship between the parties been one at arm's length. So if the loan is completely not at arm's length, then you never get to an interest deduction, right? But if it's simply a matter of the size of the interest deduction being too big, then you must still allow the deduction for that part, which is not too big. The national rules at issue do not provide for the opportunity for taxpayers to show that a transaction is commercially justified. So it just throws out all interest deductions regardless of whether they are commercially justified. This further entails that the deduction refused may not necessarily be limited to the proportion of interest which exceeds one at arm's length. So you're not even looking whether it's proportionate or not because it doesn't matter because even if it is proportionate, you're still denying the deduction and that is not allowed under EFTA rules. And then the Norwegian, the Norwegian government at least tried, right? They also said the Norwegian government submitted that in the light of Article 4 or 5 of Council Directive uh, EU, and this is the ATA di directives, um, laying down rules against tax avoidance, it would be necessary to combine the interest limitation rule with the opportunity for taxpayers to show that the transaction is commercially justified. However, uh, so, so they say, yeah, but hang on, you know, under the, under, under, under the, uh, the anti-tax avoidance directives in the EU, um, the taxpayer now has to show that, 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 that these transactions are commercially justified. Um, it's not for us to show that they are wholly artificial and the taxpayer still needs to prove that point. But, 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 but the court strikes it down and says, however, Norway's submission is not undisputed. ESA, which is the, 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 the EFTA equivalent of the Commission, maintains that the limitation rules must comply with the fundamental freedoms and an assessment on proportionality. So I'm putting this in here because our question is, you know, to what extent do the freedom of establishment hurt the BEPS rules? And, 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 and you can also see that, the, you know, the court tries here and it says, yeah, but, you know, um, we also have the ARTA, di ARTA directive, which is an EU directive, and it says that the taxpayer must prove that there's commercial rationality. So why don't you apply that yet? But the court threw out that argument. And then if we look at, 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 at what happens next, um, it, it's just, you know, what are the consequences of these cases for transfer pricing um, in, and in, the EU, in the EU and specifically for the rest of the BEPS transactions, right? I mean, Clearly, the EU applies the transfer pricing rules. It may not be, some say, the same uh, transfer pricing rules as, as, as the OECD applies, um, but, I'm, but I'm not sure they are right on that. But under the freedom of establishment and other fundamental freedoms, such as the freedom of movement, the freedom of workers, freedom of capital, freedom of services, a loss of revenue is not a justification for restriction if the transaction is not wholly artificial, i.e. if it is at arm's length and thus is commercially rational as is disguised in, uh, described in chapter one of the transfer pricing guidelines. And there's raised a number of questions, right? The first one is, can arm's length transactions ever be wholly artificial? Um, I'm not sure because these are two different rules from two different institutions, but one would have to think about that. Um, because if an arm's length uh, transaction can be wholly artificial, then it can also be maybe denied the interest deduction. 
And then, you know, there's also this link between arms uh, the transaction being at arm's length or um, if it needs to be to, to, to be requalified because it's not commercially rational. And then the question is, is every trend commercially rational transaction by definition not wholly artificial? And I think there the answer might just be yes. But then the issue is, you know, can you apply the test, for instance, do you see the same transaction between third parties and, and, and the transparency guidelines? Say you can have commercially rational transactions that you don't see between third parties because of group dynamics, such as, for instance, for the group setting up group service centers, right? To what extent does the freedom of establishment set aside BEPS action plans, such as the hybrid rules, CFC rules, the interest reduction limitation rules that we now look at, or the principal purpose test, right, under Article 29.9? This is a question that, that, that remains unanswered within EU law. I mean, the, the member states have, when they made, when they wrote the CFC rules on, 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 on Action 4 um, at the OECD, they literally planned like tax players planned how you try to get around or how do you try to avoid or evade the EU fundamental freedoms. Um, but they haven't really, to my extent, uh, to, to my knowledge, no, done that as much with regard to, 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 to the principal purpose test and, 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 and the hybrid rules. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if, if we'll get case law about that in, in future and whether, it, again, it'll be the arm's length principle, which is the only measure that, that, that applies for whether transaction is wholly artificial and therefore cannot, um, is, is justifiably denied the freedom of establishment. And then the, the last question, and I know the answer to this, so it's, it's a rhetoric question, is to what extent does common consolidated corporate tax base solve the problems combated by BEPS? And, 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 and this is, you know, in the EU, there's been for more than 20 years now a suggestion of let's have one tax base within the EU. It must be the same tax rules in every country and the results must be consolidated. And the issue with this is, you know, if you consolidate results within the EU, you take care of all the BEPS issues, right? Because interest deductions become um, irrelevant because you now will allocate profits based on, 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 on sales and on personnel and on assets. Um, whether you have a PE or not becomes irrelevant, action seven. Whether you um, whether you use hybrids or not becomes irrelevant. Um, whether you uh, whether you do any of the other BEPS actions except Action 11, of course, um, becomes irrelevant because you work with the system of profit allocation as opposed to profit calculation. So you know one can argue that if the member states really have a problem then they should simply adopt the common consolidated corporate tax base and, 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 and they will immediately become fully BEPS compliant on all fronts. So um, I will leave you with that and then I will put in the, in, 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 in the links below this video a link to a blog from Martin de Wilde and Saskia Wisman, Siska Wisman called After CJU, now the EFTA Court 2 embraces the arms length standard as a beacon, what's next? Um, and that's just giving credit where credit is due because after having read Martin and Siska's blog, I decided to make this video. It's been a long video. Um, we don't very often talk about EU law. I hope you've enjoyed this and I look forward to seeing you a next time. Bye for now. The, uh, I, I will leave you with, uh, with one last slide and the slide is showing you the final decisions from the CJU and from the EFTA court in both of these cases, and I leave you to read them at your leisure. Bye for now.